Well, the fact that you want to do quick adjustment, that's already your mistake. If it's properly organized, you shouldn't need quick adjustment unless there's an emergency or a crisis. Welcome to the marketers of the... Fuck me. <laughs> Welcome to the marketers of the universe podcast. I'm Hayden Woods-Williams, digital marketing team lead here at Brew Digital. And we are here to talk all things marketing again. We're starting today with a new repeating section of the podcast that we're calling How to Make Impactful Quick Changes. It's basically a section where our team will highlight where you can see quick wins from your different digital channels. And today, uh, or for this episode anyway, we're going to get started with paid media. We'll then head over to the event sphere to talk about how B2B companies can make the most of events. They may not all be digital, but they should be making up a significant part of your digital strategy. For now, though, let's get on with the podcast. Over to you, Ross. Thank you, Hayden. Hello, listeners. My name is Ross. I'm the chief marketing person here at Brew Digital, and I'll be your host today. I'm joined by three of the finest paid media team members at Brew. Um, we have our fearless leader, Hayden, who you might be familiar with, our resident Italian waiter, Michele, and paid media superstar, Nasia Nazera. So our first topic today is around those awkward times where you need to optimize your campaigns, but you just don't know where to start. So Nasia, we'll start with you. What's the first step you take uh, when you need to make an immediate impact on your paid campaigns? So this is assuming that my campaign has been running for quite some time. So let's say that my campaigns, um, maybe they've been running for a month or two, and I've gathered um, enough initial data to decide and it's time for optimizations the first thing I would look into is whether we need to adjust the budget and bid strategy so for me you should always always allocate a larger budget to top performing campaigns and consider cutting or re allocating budgets for um, from the underperforming ones. Assuming you've done everything you can for the underperforming ones. Um, so when adjusting your budget, um, I would say evaluate campaigns based on your spend performance and also your goal. Um, also, be careful not to overlook the broader objective or your long-term plans um, it's a common mistake that marketers make um, is that they allocate the entire budget to campaigns that excel in conversions, but don't necessarily foster account growth. So I would say you would always need to have a balance between like customer acquisition and retention. Nice. So focus on on allocating or reallocating budgets where we can maximize performance. Uh, McKenna, where do you look to first? Thank you, Ross. The first thing that I would look at is the naming convention of the campaign. Those are massively important for the well run of a strategy. Once I notice that everything is under control, I would then follow very closely what Nasia just said. If I can add something to that uh, steps, I would choose a well-defined uh, window example, last 30 days always give you an idea of what's going on. We are talking about B2B companies in this case. If we are an e-commerce, last 30 days can be extremely volatile. Um, was it Black Friday? Was it Christmas? Was it Q1? Was it summer campaign? So those 30 days need to not include any type of huge discount. Once you have this data, you look at a benchmark, set the benchmark for your main KPIs, click through rate, CBC, conversions. Once you have this benchmark, you can quickly kill all the non-performing part of your account, whether it's on paid social or paid search, and then you start optimizing what's left. 
Nice. Thank you, Michele. And Hayden, as a man who's hung up his paid media cloak in recent years, do you have any insights to share? Yeah, so I definitely don't have that um, that experience on the on the platform like the team do at the moment. I think they're definitely spending their time on there a, a lot more than me. What well, in recent years, anyway? I think what I would say is focus on what you're offering and what your content is. You know, you can change uh, as many kind of things in, in inside the platform across any of your digital channels, really. Um, but if your content sucks, then you probably won't get the, the, the kind of results that you want. I think, um, one thing that I, I try to, to always kind of get the team to do is think about the format. And if if you're running brand awareness campaigns, think about your format. If, if you're just sending people to blogs, as an example, go into those blogs, see what's in those blogs that you can pull out and put natively on the on the platform, that's going to engage people a lot more. You're probably going to get significantly cheaper um, CPMs uh, than if you're you're kind of optimizing for clicks to your website. Uh, and people will probably remember you more than than that article. I spoke recently as well about how uh, those platforms are are actually minimizing the the size of the collateral when it comes to URL links, both organically, which I know isn't the focus of this. Uh, but and paid as well. You are, uh, yeah, you're losing space when you're sending people away from the platform. Nice. Next, we're going to talk about the tools we can use to optimize in the most efficient manner. We're going to start with Michele this time. Um, which tools or platforms can you recommend to our audience to help when making changes to paid media? I always find interesting how little people use Google Ads Editor, even if you manage thousands of campaign or thousands of them, Google Ads Editor is the tool that allows you to manage in the cheapest way, the highest amount of campaign. This is for Google Ads related campaigns. If we go on paid social um, and you don't want to invest in external tool that allows you to organize and create inbound campaign, I recommend the sheet. There's some Templates that you can download, LinkedIn ads, for example, where you can build all your ads with all the variation you can imagine, and then just upload the file and everything is done in a few seconds. We all know how not user-friendly is the LinkedIn platform. So using a sheet would speed up your time. I've just noticed I had other three points. One is to use rules that allows you to automation. Tools and automation goes together. You can use automated rules or script or bit strategies to help you manage those accounts. Also, every platform has a bulk um, section where you can download templates to bulk upload ads, campaign, bit strategies, location exclusion, and things like that. Nice. I, I find with Google Ads at a time. Of the, the paid media managers that I've worked with, some people hate it, some people love it. It's really 50-50. Um, and if anyone does want to go and find some uh, re like templates that's going to help them uh, kind of put their, their ads together, there is some in our Brew Digital resource hub as well. Brewdigital.com forward slash resources and then go to templates. Solid plug there. Like it. Okay. Uh, Nasia, do you have anything to say on this one? Yeah, so I will answer this from a content creation perspective because a bulk of our work as paid marketers involves um, creating high quality relevant content and I know this can be very very time consuming for some people or most people but there are many tools out there so don't be afraid to try them out and pick pick out the ones that you like that could help you produce edit and distribute um, your content. So for me, make use of dynamic content creation tools. Like um, I personally use Canva or Adobe Express for like quick changes to the creatives for like A-B testing. We use Grammarly for polish copy, sometimes chat GPT with the right prompts. And there are lots of prompts that you could get um, and search for. 
before this, Adobe Creative Cloud for professional graphics and you know tools like Monday.com, Miro for um, collaboration. So I would say that from the tools that I would recommend or I use personally for creating content, copy and creatives. It's interesting. Everyone talked there about uh, tools they use for making changes and kind of increasing process as opposed to kind of rapid analysis. But I think we're running out of time, so we'll swiftly move on. We've spoken before in this talk, on this podcast uh, about the energy versus time graph, where we demonstrate the quick, actionable tasks within one's control versus the time and energy consuming tasks that we have much less influence over. So my question is, is there any point in worrying about aspects beyond your immediate control? Hayden, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, um, there are things outside of our immediate control, but we can influence them. And also we can learn from from people outside of um, our immediate sphere as well. So, you know, quick wins can come from speaking to the sales team. And actually, if they're giving you feedback that the leads that you're sending aren't right, listen to them, don't get upset. Listen to them and find out what leads are right, because you can then adapt your targeting and test some new audiences that might be closer to who they are. So for me, that kind of conversation outside of, of um, your immediate influence or your immediate control is super important. Nice. Uh, Michele, any thoughts? Well, someone has to worry about something. So yes, you should worry. But before you do that, make sure everything that is in your power is done following the best practices. So before worry about you being at the top of your game, getting everything absolutely perfect, and then you can start worrying about the others. I think with that as well, if we've got if we've not got business objectives as as marketers, then we really need to be pushing the, the, the team on that. If you don't have um, that business strategy coming down, or actually if your product is just a little bit subpar, then also you need to potentially look at pushing back on those things that you don't have immediate control on. Because ultimately, if you have a bad product or there is no direction for the company, it's going to make you look like a bad marketer because you can't measure your success accurately unless you have that information. Perfect. Uh, Nasia, anything to add? I would say generally in life, you shouldn't be worrying about things you can't control. I would love to get into stoicism a bit more, but this isn't the <laughs> podcast for that. Um, and especially in paid um, marketing, since it involves money, it's natural to want to control all aspects of your campaign. But focusing too much on things beyond your immediate control, as what Hayden and Michele touched on, can be counterproductive. So instead, it's better to concentrate on what you can influence directly, like ad copy, landing pages, creatives, audience targeting, bidding, budget, and things like that. What I'm trying to say is while it's important to be aware of external factors like the wider business strategy, workflows, sales strategy, the most effective paid campaigns focus is to optimize what you can control and by doing so you'll be better equipped to adapt to changes and not feel like you've hit a wall every time plus it's marketing you'll you'll be fine yes no one's gonna die it's only marketing eh? we all forget <laughs> that so it wouldn't be a podcast topic if we didn't talk about the things you shouldn't do when making adjustments to paid strategies so I'm going to ask the team, what common mistakes do marketers make when they're trying to make quick adjustments to paid campaigns? I'm going to leave it open to the floor. Who wants to jump in? Well, the fact that you want to do quick adjustments, that's already your mistake. If it's properly organized, you shouldn't need quick adjustment unless there's an emergency or a crisis. Said that, I think one of the most important things is to give time to the campaign. All these new platform are working with algorithm that needs time and data to adjust themselves. So you can't do a change and five minutes after go and check if, if it worked. Take your time, give the algorithm time to learn, and then repeat. It's a, it's a bold claim. Don't make quick adjustments at all. 
Um, I think you have to make quick adjustments if something is looking looking like it's not working. Um, you know, I think it's the case with most paid campaigns. They don't work off the bat. So maybe that's the point. Um, one thing I would say is a mistake that I see people make all the time is, is getting far too attached to certain pieces of content or certain ad campaigns. Like listen to the data. If something is not working and it's not looking like it's adding to your kind of objectives, then don't let your attachment to it stop you from uh, ending that campaign and, and moving in a new direction. Uh, if you're not running a test right now, go work on a test and get one running. Perfect. And Michele, you touched on timescales there for waiting for optimizations. Can we suggest a rule of thumb for an amount of time to wait? In our experience looking at the account, if we launch new campaign, they need at least 14, 20 days before the learning phase is ended, working with low budget amount. If you have enough budget, the seven days should be enough. Uh, and finally, Nasia, do you have anything to add in terms of mistakes to avoid? Well, it's very tempting to make quick adjustments. Um, I agree, like not giving time for your campaign to stabilize um, and also making too many changes at once in a short period of time. I've made this mistake before when I first started marketing. You will have a difficult time identifying which changes had a positive or a negative impact. And the most important one is ignoring the bigger picture. I need to remind myself this every time because it's so easy to focus on quick wins or engulf yourself in immediate performance metrics like CPL, CTR, and all that. So whatever adjustments you make, it must align with your long-term goals or plan. Thank you. And finally, what's one thing that our audience can take away from this call to bear in mind when making impactful changes to their paid strategy? Any optimizations that you do, don't do it based on your assumptions or gut feeling, uh, or if you think that it would work. Always consult with your stakeholders, always talk to your team about it, and make sure whatever strategy that you're doing, um, it's well targeted and it's based on historical data. Nice. Michele? I think what I wish they told me um, when I started was to trust more editors and scripts to help speed up what we do. So my takeaway is to explore more Google Ads editor, Microsoft editor, bulk upload, scripts and rules. Yes, I'm always deeply impressed when I see scripts being used, but I've still never been able to wrap my head around them. Hayden, anything to add? Yeah, I'm going to link back to content, which, to be honest, is probably the the running theme through you know the, every episode of the, the podcast we've we've ever put out. Look at your content and try to work out how you can make it stand out. Ads are super competitive. If you don't have good content, you will just sink into the background and yeah, cease to be seen by anyone. Um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for listening to the first topic of our podcast. I hope you found some useful snippets in our session. You can go away and put them into your own marketing strategy. Our second topic today, we are digging into the world of B2B events. Um, they tend to make up a significant amount of, of what we do as marketers. All of a sudden, the time events can completely drain resource across the team. But there's always the question... Is it worth it? Am I making the most of it? Is it a massive budget drain? So we'll be digging into uh, the experience of, of some of our team to work out whether or not you should be focusing your B2B marketing strategy or including events in your B2B marketing strategy. Uh, over to Debbie to introduce that one. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session. My name is Debbie. I'm the so Senior Social Media Manager here at Brew. Uh, today's very interesting topic. Um, it's actually something that is at my, in my mind at the moment, as I am covering big events um, for one of our clients. 
One is a conference of Monday.com, which is Elevate, and the upcoming one of Atlassian, which is Team 24 Europe. I've always wondered, you know, these B2B events that are floating um, and all of our clients jumping on it, are they worth it? Um, with me on this session or this episode um, is Kieran and Hayden. Hi, guys. Um, do you guys still need introductions or do you think our listeners would probably know you by now? I think we should, we, I, I could give a little introduction as to why I'm qualified to, to speak about B2B events. Let's go. Why are you qualified to speak on B2B events, Hayden? Is anyone really qualified to speak about anything? Um, I'm really hogging the, the limelight in this, uh, in this, this episode of the podcast. No, um, I, I have worked before my time at Brew Digital. I spent five years working um, for a company who put on both exhibitions and conferences in the B2B event space, working with massive clients from the kind of gambling industry and beyond. So hopefully I'll have some kind of insights into that and and some stories to tell about how, how people were able to have really effective B2B events. Thank you, Hayden. Let's go with Kieran. Kieran, do you have also like B2B experience in events or is it something... Just an interesting topic that you also have been like rushing in and just want to jump into. Uh, a bit of both. I mean, I uh, it's exactly the same story as, as Hayden just replaced gambling with the holiday industry. Although the people in the holiday industry do like to gamble. So, <laughs> um, so that's that. And also it's a, it's an interesting topic just to kind of keep on keep on top of as we uh, at Brew do go to B2B events as well and are planning on going to many more in 2025. That is true. So we're looking forward to meeting, you know, potential customers and conferences. So see you all soon, hopefully in the flesh. And um, yeah, so the take the, the thing that we want to answer in this episode is how can our listeners, B2B marketers, uh, make the most of the events? Let's start off of like what makes a good event? Like how can you make sure that everything goes smoothly? I think ultimately you can't. So much of being at an event is is chaotic. You're not in charge of the actual event being put on, um, unless it is obviously your own event. But most of the time, if you're attending a B2B exhibition or conference, you're not. So you really need to try and focus on the things that you can control. You know, look at the objectives for the event. Make sure that the event that you're going to, there is a reason and there is a measurable outcome. Um, for why you're attending that event. Use audience insights for those, you know, event websites to understand what the demographics are for the people who are, are visiting the websites, because that's probably going to line up with the people who are at the event and make sure that it's in line with your ideal customer profile. If you kind of do those three things, I feel like you can probably have a, a reasonably solid platform to start planning the event from. Absolutely. Um, I think probably just on the uh, on the back of that as well, a good way to have a successful uh, event, you, whether you're actually hosting or not, is also pre-scheduled meetings. I think that was one of the big things that I learned uh, straight for straight away was arranging meetings with you know your key prospects or even existing clients. It's that's a really important thing to to have as well um, before the event because you just have something there at the event that you're you, you're going to be speaking with people i think it's important to ensure that you've kind of booked in some face-to-face -face interaction it just it also for me it's like having something in the back pocket i get nervous uh, at events um uh, i still have to i still end up going to them it's nice to have those kind of face-to-face -face interactions or meetings in the back pocket because it means that when you for me anyway when i speak to prospects new people who i've never met before i feel a bit more confident feels a bit more organic and uh i guess less uh less desperate that can also be a thing it's all about attitude i think you have to like cultivate the the team that you take to an event um because some people like kieran are going to be really comfortable with those pre-organized meetings but actually you may have people who are much more um comfortable with actually speaking to people on the fly when they come up to the stand and you need to uh, you need to make make sure that the team that are at the event are able to do both those things um and try and make sure that those people who you take 
aren't going to be the kind of people who actually just huddle in on themselves. And a lot of the time that comes with experience, actually. Like the first few times you go to an event, the natural thing is to not talk to anyone, hide on your laptop or speak in a group of people that you know. But the more you go, the more comfortable you become being that kind of person to initiate conversation. Um, and you need to have people that can do that. Absolutely. I think uh, one one hint I will say, although some people seem to be very successful at it, is I cannot deal with talking with prospects over lunch. <laughs> oh, it's the worst. It's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> it is the that's the thing for me it's just rip the band-aid off you've got when you have your pre-arranged meetings you've got your pockets of time to go out do your prospecting do your chats over a coffee or after like a talk and so on and then just leave your lunch to then have your laptop time to hide in the corner and, and, and eat in peace i have i still have anxiety over um over, over broccoli uh, at events i i can't <laughs> i can't have it <laughs> I, 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 this is like we could make an episode about this uh kieran like experiences during conferences well um i think you both have touched on really good topics on how to make you know an event go smoothly and how to speak with prospects what can people prepare in advance but something that i'm very curious about is a lot of our clients are going to, you know, events that are big, like 2,000 plus people or 3,000 plus people, even if it's 300 people type of event. Like, how can you make sure that you stand out and you really connect with the audience that you want? I'm going to think- ask this from Kieran because Kieran does attend events um, for Burr Digital. And then Hayden, I would love to know what you think as well. It's cut through, which is, you know, the old PR term. You got to get that cut through. I think pre-event promotion is an extremely important way of getting getting that cut through, especially if you, uh, it depends on what tier of event that you're, you're going to and, and how much you've paid to be there as well. You can normally get a list of the attendees going, which will help you advertise towards, you know, to them. So your social media and email marketing, you want to be promoting your participation and so on through social media and emails and so on and sharing what your company is going to be offering or showcasing at the event, exclusive content, that kind of thing. You know, you want to basically build your anticipation and attract um, people who are going to your booth or where or section or wherever. You want to make sure that they, they're primed basically for it. And then once you're actually there, it's creating engaging experiences, which I'm sure Debbie, you're quite specialized in nowadays with all the events that that we we go to with not only as brew digital but also as the wider uh, adaptivist group so you've got your interactive booths and and so on product demos etc depending on you know what industry you're in but i think something that is you can see across the board will be like workshops and speaking slots i think hosting those workshops securing speaking slots you position your company as a thought leader and you're able to provide valuable insights you know that align with your audience's needs and and desires and and so on i think uh, that's a really important thing to help you stand out against everyone else yeah echoing what kieran said events companies are going to jump on you kind of mentioning their conference or their exhibition because it gives them Uh, promotion as well to your audience so always make sure that when you are putting content together you're mentioning that exhibition you're calling them out on on the organic social channels that you're using i think there's also a lot of packages that that events offer around digital advertising as well these days so whether that's kind of retargeting uh, their kind of website audiences that can be quite an effective way of doing it albeit obviously there are regulations around that these days I've never really been a fan of the email blast that event organizations often sell. But if you can make something that stands out, that it's going to be picked up organically in a newsletter or some kind of marketing that the um, the event is going to do, that is always really impactful as well. And then the last thing for me, when you're actually at the event, it's really crafting a solid hook. I think, you know, you're probably not going to be the biggest stand. You're not going to have 
the best space. The most likely thing to happen is you're going to be in a corner that you're not that happy with. No matter what happens, that's that's my experience is, is people are in places that they don't want to be. There's always something to complain about. But actually, a lot of the reasons behind that is because they've not cultivated a hook. They've not given people a reason to come and talk to you. Come and chat to us is not a good enough, good enough reason. Think about what you can offer people in value the exact same way that you would with any other digital channel or any other marketing channel that um, think about what you can offer as a media value to ignite a conversation. Uh, and that also doesn't mean give away an iPad because then you just get thrifters. I hate that. Yeah, good point. Um, I have seen quite a few um, brands and events that are basically just giving away everything, a raffle here, giveaway there. And it, it, this is a good question. How, let, let's think about like good practice. In the events that you've been to or have seen or maybe heard of, are there any brands that have really, you know, done something remarkable, something that stands out in an event that you felt like that was quite smart? I wish we would have thought of a, about that. I was listening to, I'm, I'm going to have to apologize because I cannot remember off the top of my head the source of this information, but I'm going to say it anyway, which is going to really upset Tom. In <laughs> I was listening to a podcast recently uh, around sustainability and events. Um, I believe it was the Marketing Society um, podcast, who are also our client. How cool is that? And in that episode, this um this woman was talking about sustainability in events and at events there is this idea that people love free t-shirts and stuff but actually most of the time people don't like free t-shirts they like getting stuff and then they get halfway home and realize that actually they don't want to have your brand logo across their front unless they're maybe going to the gym with it and even then it's probably a really cheap t-shirt so it's not even going to be comfortable she was talking about how they replaced getting all that pre-printed swag with having a swag desk on the stand um, of a couple of their exhibitors. So instead of the people who wanted the swag kind of coming up and taking it away and then, you know, 50% of those T-shirts ended up in the bin outside the exhibition hall, you had people coming up and placing an order. And because you're placing an order, you can get higher quality stuff because you're not having to order bulk order hundreds of it um and you're only giving it to people who genuinely want it and you're able to see which customers are really involved and engaged with your brand there i don't have an example that's anywhere near as smart as that i just uh all i remember is an arcade games company going absolute hail mary at this one event that i went to and they had had a giant arcade uh, machine which was pac-man and it was a showstopper because it was about 15 foot tall. It was a way of encouraging uh, the holiday parks to think differently around their play area and arcades machines. And actually, rather than it being just these small machines when they all look the same, it's like, what would you do? What would you have as something that really stands out? And rather than just bringing a couple of little things here and there, they just went all in on this big machine. And I tell you what, everyone was on it all day. And they mm. did get good signups from it because obviously to queue up to play, there was an iPad there where you had to fill in your information. So there was a little bit there in an understanding of we can get customers, we can, you know, we can get some contacts and get some data on it, people who were genuinely interested. But it also meant that people were talking about it throughout the day. And it was a great opportunity if you wanted to have a break from events, from you know, because you do have to sometimes just take five minutes can be a little bit overwhelming. But they were just able to play um, Pac-Man with each other, which also helped as a, a networking thing as well. There is a conversation with one of our clients, like thinking about, uh, you know, moving away from merch um, to something that is a bit more experiential. And it would be very interesting to see how that pans out on a very big event um, that is like 2000 plus people. So we are almost ending um, or we have to end. I could talk about this for a long time. I, I want to, you know, throw this question to our panelists um, and push you a little bit to, you know, share something concise, three points um, that our listeners can apply tomorrow or if not later today. 
So let's say they've been to an event. Um, how can they do, what is the best thing that they can do to turn their attendees into loyal customers? Listen to them. <laughs> it's listening to them. There's always the case with anything to do with, with marketing and advertising is actually listening to what your client or your customer actually wants or, or, or desires. But, it, it, you know, listening only gets you so far. You have to follow that up with with actions. So once they're, you know, they're captured and qualified and so on, it's like what, for us, it would be what content we're able to to provide to them, whether that's educational sessions or live demos or something like that. But it's also the relationship building side of it. How do we let them know that we appreciate them um, and help to deepen that relationship? So is that a further event afterwards? Is it uh, one-to-one meetings? Um, I think the main thing is is making sure that your follow-up is timely and personalized and um, kind of nurtures them. Yeah, I think there is there are different types of people that you want to follow up with because you've got general ones who popped by the stand and dropped a business card or dropped a bit of information. You've got those people that you had an in-depth conversation with and have some detail on. And then you've got the people that you you made a real connection with. And I think those three types of people you have to treat so differently because if you send those people that you had a very brief touch point with a, a, a follow-up that goes, it was so great having a long chat with you. They're like, I don't have a chat with you. What are you on about? You're mental. Go away. Whereas if you um, if you kind of do don't give enough information to that person who you had the in detail chat with, you're in in the dangerous territory of potentially losing them to a customer. There are hundreds of people at exhibitions. Those people that you're following up with are going to have follow ups everywhere. Like they've they've had so many so many more conversations. And even if they made the most concrete promises to you, the likelihood is they also did to someone else as well. Um, so I think it's just about kind of understanding the context at which you had conversations with people and try to think of, of that data that comes from events as more than just a pool of data. Those are people, segment them out, put the right thought into the messaging, offer them value and continue that conversation. Amazing. There you have it. Um, there's such a big importance in planning to go to an event, to really understanding the value that you will uh, give to your customers. Um, our panelists mentioned about hooks. So what is it that, you know, how can you get the people to you versus you just bombarding them with emails? And lastly, treat them as humans, not just as a lead name or an iPad input. Let them know that, you know, you have that had the conversation and that the content or the value or the um, products or services that you offer is actually aligned to their goals. So thank you, everyone. If you enjoyed this, um, please do let us know any other topics that you'd like us to touch on. We do talk about marketing here, but we also are very interested with the real topics. So. Thank you to our listeners and hope to see you in the next one. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, That is all we have time for today. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you found some useful snippets uh, in our two sessions um, and you're able to go away and put them into your own strategies. We love that you've made it this far for your listen. We really enjoy making this content. And would really love it if you could recommend this show to even one colleague or friend that you think would would find it useful. Thank you also to the Brew Digital team for their research and input into the session. Um, Make sure to go and check out our past episodes. Subscribe on whatever platform you use to listen to your podcasts. And we'll see you on the next one. I've been Hayden and these are the Marketers of the Universe. Before I begin, guys, um, this is such a bad timing, but my food delivery is four minutes away. So we have to stop and pretend that everything's okay.